Uh, my name is Nessa Rachmanina. I am in charge of providing charity services to the children and the research in special clinical and translational research. And it's my great pleasure to introduce you a truly remarkable speaker today, um, Dr. Liz Monfenson. She doesn't like me to say this word, but she is a remarkable uh, person in many ways. In many ways, everything we do today in the HIV world and the pediatric adolescent HIV providers is because of the studies and the work that we have done over the years. Just briefly, is she's board certified pediatrician um, who received her degree from Albert Stein College of Medicine and then followed the pediatric residence at Boston Children's Hospital. We then became chief resident in section to discover the University of Massachusetts Medical School and went straight working for the CDC division in Massachusetts Department of Health working on infectious disease. And then in 1989, she joined NIH, National Institute of Child Health Development, and Ms. Kennedy Schreiber, Institute of Child Health, and became a leader, uh, first nationally, and then internationally, of the pediatric HIV. The most famous problem, many of you have heard, the ACPG 76 protocol, first study to show that you can use ideology to prevent transmission of HIV virus from mother to the child was created by Lynn, and she was the one to lead this effort which allowed us to cut the transmission from HIV from mother to the child. But we less than one or two percent globally right now we are in this range. So truly a remarkable contribution. In uh, just 2014, just six years now ago, she retired from an age and joined the Northern Pleasure Pediatric Aid Foundation, where she leads a lot of research, and I have a pleasure working part time together with me there. But over the years, that has been a person who favors anyone who comes across HIV. You know, you not only study them, you work by them. And truly, in addition to everything that I told you now, there are so more than 400 publications. Um, just to tell you that I do have one slide, but I don't think I had a chance to send it to you to show. In addition to that, Lynn is a wonderful, wonderful and reliable, very friend and colleague, avid traveler, absolutely amazing professional photographer, and a great cat lover. <laughs> so, Lynn, welcome. We are truly honored to have you. Incidents. 
As a partner's prep study, 2008 to 2012, in Kenya and Uganda, over 4,700 couples. So they combined these, the, the data from these two studies that both had frequent testing for HIV and for pregnancy, either monthly or quarterly, and collected monthly sexual act frequency and condom use, and looked at genetically linked incident HIV, which permitted a link to sexual behavior. And they divided study time into early pregnancy, which is the first trimester, later pregnancy, second, third trimester, um, birth to six months postpartum, or non pregnant. So in this study, there were 605 pregnancies over a median of 24 months, with 78 linked into the HIV infection. And this figure shows you the adjusted probability of HIV transmission per thousand condomless sex acts. And it's adjusted for condom use, reproductive stage, male viral load, the age of the woman, and whether she was in the active prep arm of the partner's prep study. Oh, that says value instead of number here. <clears throat> um, so that should be, uh, for non-pregnant women, it should be 1.1 1 .1, uh, per thousand condom of sex acts compared to 2.9 uh, for pregnancy through postpartum. And you can see that there's a statistically significant increase in the pregnancy through postpartum group, uh, 2.7. And when you uh, look at it by pregnancy stage, what you see is, again, the 1.1 in the non-pregnant. For early pregnancy, that should be 2.2, which has borderline statistical significance. But you can see, compared to the non-pregnant <laughs> stage, in late pregnancy and uh, in the early postpartum period, there is a significant risk, uh, significant increased risk in uh, risk of sexual acquisition in the pregnant woman. Uh, and adjusted relative risk of 2.8 and up uh, 4. So significant risk of transmission in pregnant women. And this increased risk of HIV transmission per sex act translates into high rates of incident HIV infection during pregnancy at the early postpartum period. And these are data from uh, 19 studies in a meta-analysis done by Alan and Drake from the University of Washington. Uh, and you can see that the incident, uh, HIV incident in pregnancy was 4.7 per 100 person years, so 4.7 percent. Postpartum, 2.9 per 100 person years, and when you combine them, 3.8 per 100 person years. So that's a 3.8 incidence of pre uh, uh, HIV in pregnant women per year. Now, WHO defines substantial risk of HIV infection as an incidence of more than three infections per 100 patient years. So clearly, pregnancy in the postpartum period constitutes periods of substantial risk of HIV acquisition for women. And incident HIV infection during pregnancy and breastfeeding is also associated with an increased risk of mother-to-child transmission. And these are data from the same meta-analysis. Five studies looked at mother-child transmission with incident versus chronic infection. And overall, there was a 2.8-fold increased risk of mother-to-child transmission with incident infection. So clearly, if we want to eliminate pediatric HIV infection, that is not going to be possible without eliminating incident infection for pregnant and postpartum women. So one way to do that is to use PrEP in pregnancy and postpartum. And I'm going to briefly talk about PrEP effectiveness in women and PrEP adherence in women. So PrEP is effective in preventing HIV infection in both men and women. And this is a meta-analysis of 18 studies. PrEP significantly reduced HIV acquisition compared to placebo by 51%, and that is in the million box. There was no significant difference in efficacy by sex or age in those red boxes or by drug regimen, dosing, or mode of acquisition. The big thing that was associated with efficacy, it was driven by PrEP adherence. And if there was low adherence, there was no efficacy moderate to high adherence there was. And PrEP 
as effective in preventing HIV infection in young African women. There were a substantial number of young African women enrolled in these PrEP clinical trials. The partners PrEP that showed 70% efficacy of PrEP had 33% of its uh, patients women aged less than 30 years. The TPS2 Botswana study, 62% efficacy of PrEP, 46% uh, were women, and most of these were under 30. And the boy study, which was all women with the median age of 25, if you looked at the women who actually took the tenofovir, women with ever detectable tenofovir in the plasma, there was a 53% detective effect. So this is effective in young African women. And when taken, PrEP is as effective in preventing HIV infection in young women as men. Another meta-analysis of adherence and efficacy of oral PrEP specifically focused on women, which included five trials, the FEMPREP trial, the Voice trial, TBF2 Botswana, Partners PrEP, and the Bangkok study, which was really uh, injecting drug users. And you can see that there's wide variations in appearance and efficacy between the studies. And if you look at the blue boxes, you can see those studies with low adherence, uh, 24 to 30% adherence, there was no efficacy of PrEP in the study. But if you look at those studies with high uh, adherence, uh, 77 to 81%, you can see there was significant adherence. So oral PrEP is effective in women with moderate and even high, high and moderate adherence, 75% adherence, 61% efficacy, 50% adherence, 52% efficacy. These numbers are very similar to what you saw in the NSM trial. Now, daily PrEP is most optimal for women. This is a study from Linda Gale Becker uh, in South Africa, and they randomized 178 seronegative women, median age of 26 years, to taking PrEP daily, time-driven, which was twice weekly, plus after sex, or event-driven, which was pre and post sex. And this table shows you coverage uh, for sex act, adherence, tenofovir detection, and seroconversions by daily, time-driven, and event-driven PrEP. And you can easily see that daily PrEP dosing resulted in higher coverage of sex events, 75% versus 56 and 51%, increased adherence, 75% versus 65, 53%, increased detection of tenofovir, 68% versus 58 and 41%, and no seroconversions in the group on daily PrEP. So daily PrEP and good adherence may be particularly important to women <coughs> while they're pregnant. And this is a recent study, and it compared levels of tenofovir in plasma and intracellular tenofovir diphosphate in dry blood clots in pregnant and non-pregnant unaffected women receiving PrEP. So tenofovir and tenofovir diphosphate levels were lower during pregnancy compared to the non-pregnant period, even after adjusting for adherence, and this is likely due to an increased renal clearance of tenofovir in late pregnancy when the renal output goes up. The clinical significance of this, however, is unclear because there's no defined threshold for what is protective or not protective. So this figure shows you the tenofovir levels compared between pregnancy and first, second, and third trimester uh, in women with 100% adherence as um, evaluated by MEMS cap. Um, the 35 nanogram uh, per ml level of tenofovir correlates with daily use, and tenofovir levels were 58% lower in pregnancy uh, than non-pregnancy. Um, although most levels were above that 35 nanogram per ml. This now looks at tenofovir diphosphate levels, again in women with 100% adherence, and the diphosphate levels were 27% lower in pregnancy than non-pregnancy. So daily prep with good adherence may be most critical for women during pregnancy, and they need, need special support to be able to do that. Now, young African women have high adherence to PrEP during periods of risk. And this is a study from Kenya and Uganda, a demonstration project 
in serodiscordant couples. And what they did was they put the HIV negative partner, um, HIV negative women, on PrEP during the period that their partner was first starting antiretrovirals. So there was a risk period of six months where the woman took PrEP. And then once the partner was on therapy for more than six months and undetectable, the PrEP was stopped. And this was looking at safe, safer conception. Um, and what you can see is that in the women, 78% as a whole took six or more doses. And even the youngest women, women less than 25, 67% um, took greater than six doses. And when they looked at PrEP efficacy comparing the number of infections observed to the number of infections expected with historical risk match controls, you saw a significant difference. So looking at the population as a whole, the number of infections observed was three, with an incidence rate of 0.05 per 100 patient years, compared to 41 infections expected, 7.6 per 100 patient years. So that translates to 93% efficacy. And for those less than 25, you saw 91% efficacy. So women during a period of risk, they know they're at risk, they take the drug. And pregnancy may be a motivator for adherence. Uh, this is from the partner's PrEP study, and they found high adherence to PrEP during the periconception period. So out of the um, over 1,700 uninfected women in this placebo-controlled trial, 267 of them had pregnancy. And adherence to study drug, whether it was the blinded PrEP or the blinded placebo, was highest among the 267 women who experienced pregnancy, with 95 to 100% adherence to study drug in the six months prior to pregnancy. So what about PrEP safety in pregnancy? I'm going to briefly review data from pregnant women with HIV on tenofovir treatment data from pregnant women with hepatitis B monotherapy, mono infection, receiving tenofovir from PMTCT with hepatitis B, and then the limited data we have on uninfected pregnant women with this stuff. So in terms of tenofovir treatment of HIV infected women during pregnancy, a number of studies have shown that there is not a worse birth outcome with tenofovir based treatments. In 2017, there were two meta-analyses published that concluded that, and since then, there have been six additional observational studies involving over 7,800 women with similar conclusions, and the references are listed here for people who want to look it up. Now, this is looking at a meta-analysis of 10 studies in women with hepatitis B without HIV who are receiving tenofovir for hepatitis B, TMTCT. <clears throat> and you can see there was no significant difference in birth defects, preterm delivery, low birth weight, or fetal death between tenofovir and the comparative group. And there have been five studies published in this meta-analysis, again, with similar findings in over 600 women and again, the studies are listed here if you want to look them up. Now we have limited data on oral PrEP in women without HIV during pregnancy. There are five completed studies. Partners PrEP, Fem PrEP, and Voice were all randomized contro controlled trials, placebo controlled, um, where women were monitored for pregnancy and when they, once they were found to be pregnant, the drug was stopped. So this is preconception exposure to early pregnancy. And the Partners Demonstration Project and the PREA program are both demonstration projects looking at implementation. And here, women generally started PrEP in the second trimester. Um, and total, there's 903 pregnancies. And you can see, just looking at the pregnancy outcomes and infant outcome columns, there was really no difference in pregnancy outcomes or infant outcomes um, in placebo and uh, PrEP in randomized trials, nor in the, um, the demonstration projects, no adverse events. So when will we have more data? So there are nine ongoing and planned studies that will evaluate pregnancy and infant outcomes following PrEP exposure 
during pregnancy and breastfeeding. Some of these are ongoing, some have not yet started, and all are expected to be completed within two years by 2022, with um, over 6,000 women with data on perinatal infant growth and bone health outcomes should be available. Um, and you can see some of these studies are looking at preconception exposure onward, while some of the studies are starting during pregnancy. I'll just briefly mention what they are. In Kenya, there is a randomized trial, a universal versus targeted breast edema study, uh, another study looking at breast in young adults. The impact study will be looking at women who choose or do not choose PrEP and looking at enhanced adherence support. In South Africa, they're looking at a PrEP cascade pregnant in postpartum women. I'll talk a little bit about that one at the end. There's a safer conception study, a randomized uh, trial, uh, another trial looking at higher PrEP dosing, and then some observational registry. So we should have data. What about safety of PrEP in breastfeeding? This is a systematic review of eight studies that quantified tenofovir exposure to either the fetus or the breastfeeding infant in uh, infants of women with HIV on tenofovir based treatment. The estimated transplacental passage to the fetus was 60%, with maternal levels around 260 nanograms per ml, compared to fetal levels of about 147 to 160. There was very poor passage of tenofovir into breast milk, so one would expect that you would see minimal exposure if you measured the drug in the infant. And indeed, that is what you saw, given the limited exposure in milk, plus the fact that tenofovir itself, the active drug, is very poorly absorbed orally. Breastfed infants have very low if any levels of tenofovir, estimated to be 0.01 to 0.04% recommended therapeutic dose. So tenofovir used by breastfeeding women should be safe with minimal to no exposure to the infant. I uh, just wanted to briefly talk about bone and renal effects in uninfected women. Now there are, I looked last night, there are no data on renal and bone effects with PrEP in HIV uninfected pregnant women. We should have this data from the studies that I talked about earlier, but currently there's nothing. So this is focused on uninfected women. Uh, and this is data on bone mineral density changes from the BOYS trial um, conducted in Uganda and Zimbabwe, and they monitored bone mineral density at baseline every six months during active PrEP, and then every six months after stopping PrEP. And PrEP use was associated with a significant but small decrease in hip and spine bone mineral density that reversed after stopping PrEP. So this shows you what happened during active PrEP. Uh, these graphs look at the mean bone mineral density percent change, and the change showed a net loss in bone mineral density from baseline to week 48 in the PrEP patients in the solid line compared to the placebo patients dotted line that was minus 0.9% for the hip, minus 1.4% for the spine, and this was looking at patients who were adherent uh, in the voice trial, because folks know at the voice trial a lot of women were not adherent to PrEP. Then they looked at what happened after PrEP stopped, and you can see that after stopping PrEP, the, um, the bone mineral change density was actually significantly greater. <coughs> In the PrEP group, 0.7% higher for hip, 0.9% higher for spine, basically bringing the women back to their baseline level. So it's reversible. Clinically relevant to clinical renal function in adult HIV uninfected women and men on PrEP is rare and again reversible. Um, so this uh, shown here is from the Partners PrEP and Demonstration Project in Kenya and Uganda. 33% of their population was female, and decline in creatinine clearance to less than 60 ml per minute, or a significant increase in serum creatinine was very rare, less than 1%. You can see uh, 0.7 and 0.8% in the partners PrEP study that monitored every three uh, months, and in the demonstration project where they monitored every six months, 0.2 and 0.4. So very few people have 
in those who do have toxicity, this is reversible. And these are data from the Partners PrEP study, um, where they monitored almost 4,000 patients. They saw a small reduction in estimated glomerular filtration rate with PrEP that reversed within weeks after stopping. So at baseline, 129 in both groups. Um, during the study, 131 in the placebo group in green, 129 in the tenofovir group in blue, 128 in the tenofovir FTC group in red, and then after stopping, it goes to one. <coughs> so minimal decline comes back to normal when you stop. So this is very reassuring data. You need to see it in pregnant women, however. So what's the potential impact of PrEP in pregnancy? So modeling studies suggest the potential for a major impact on population level HIV incidence and mother child transmission. And I'll show you one uh, recent study. And this is uh, using the PISA model. And they modeled the potential impact of PrEP in pregnant and breastfeeding women in South Africa from 2020 to 2030. Consider two different scenarios, a conservative scenario that matched the PrEP experience in the demonstration project in Kenya, where the uptake was 32% in high-risk women and 11% in low-risk women. And then an optimistic scenario where PrEP was initiated by 80% of all pregnant women. And they assumed women took the PrEP throughout pregnancy and breastfeeding. And they compared the reduction in HIV incidence with PrEP in pregnancy to that with PrEP in female sex workers with MSM and adolescent girls and some women. So this model demonstrated significant HIV infection averted in South Africa, 2.5% reduction in total transmission in the conservative scenario, 7.2% reduction in the optimistic scenario, and I would just point out that even the conservative estimates of PrEP in pregnant breastfeeding women yielded reductions in HIV transmission that were equivalent to the impact of PrEP in female sex workers and MSM. Without PrEP, they estimated 76,000 new cases of mother to child transmission expected under standard of care, which included repeat HIV testing and very good ART coverage in pregnant and breastfeeding women. And with PrEP provision to pregnant and breastfeeding women, they expected transmission would be reduced by 13.2% in the conservative scenario, and almost by half, 41% in the optimistic scenario. So highly promising in terms of reducing transmission. So what about policies and implementation? This shows you the evolution of WHO recommendations for PrEP over time. 2012, PrEP was a conditional recommendation for MSN transgender women and zero discord for couples. 2014 brought the results of the clinical trials in MSN. This turned into a strong recommendation for MSN, remained conditional for transgender women and sex workers. Um, and you can see here there's nothing mentioned about pregnancy at all. 2015, PrEP now was recommended for people at substantial HIV risk, three uh, for 100 person years, as we talked about, as a strong recommendation, and it was added to the essential medicines list in March 2017. And it wasn't until July 2017 that the WHO addressed pregnancy, and it stated that in PrEP trials, exposure to tenofovir containing PrEP in the first trimester was not associated with adverse pregnancy or infant outcomes. And this was came from those two meta analyses I referred to before. And they noted that the risk of mother to child transmission outweighs any potential risk of PrEP, including any risk of fetal infant exposure to tenofovir in PrEP regimen. And since July 2017, there have been a number of implementation models and toolkits uh, phone prep apps that have been developed by WHO that you can look up if you use these references. So what about country prep policies? So this was the status as of June 2018 uh, on the uptake of these policies. And in green, you see countries that have adopted prep. 
and in our agency countries with policy pending. And as of June 2018, 19 high income and 21 low income countries have adopted or pending a PREP policy, 35 adopting a policy, 5 pending a policy. If, uh, if they recommended 18 of these 32 national guidelines, stated pregnancy was not a contraindication, so were permissive. Eight countries did not contraindicate PrEP in breastfeeding. Three countries didn't mention PrEP in pregnancy at all, but did mention it for zero discord in couples trying to conceive. And 11 countries didn't mention PrEP in pregnancy or breastfeeding at all. So here's what happens in just a few months. As of March 2019, there's been uh, an extraordinary increase in the number of countries with pending PrEP policies. So now we have in blue those countries who have adopted policy, one additional country, Mexico. And now in orange, you see those pending, 37 countries have a pending PrEP policy. And the most recent data that I've seen in the end of 2018, we now have only 20 countries with pending policies, so that would be uh, 35 plus 17 additional that have uh, adopted a PrEP policy. So this increase in PrEP policies is good, but policy does actually not correlate with actual PrEP use. And this comes from uh, a PrEP tracker looking at the total number of current PrEP enrollees, which is estimated to be under 400,000. So the darker the color, the more the PrEP use, um, with the dark green, over 25,000 PrEP initiations per country, um, and then we have the light green being very few. The United States represents the largest share of global PrEP use. But while women account for about 19% of all new HIV diagnoses in the U.S., they make up only 7% of PrEP users. So what's urgently needed is a strategic rapid transition from having uh, policies and putting targets on paper to actually a more meaningful support of demand generation efforts and equitable access to sexually reproductive health services for women. Um, so I want to give you some examples of country PrEP policies in pregnancy. The most advanced comes from Eswatini. This is just last year, their clinical implementation guide for PrEP. They specifically mention pregnant and lactating women as an indication for PrEP. In Zimbabwe, zero discordant couples and pregnant women in relationships with men of unknown status are recommended for PrEP, so they are also mentioned pregnancy. Botswana and Kenya uh, say PrEP should be used in discord in couples trying to conceive, but do not mention pregnancy or breastfeeding. South Africa is interesting because it says that PrEP is important to use, but then they give this caveat. As data relating to the safety of PrEP, specifically with regard to the developing fetus, are limited, the onus is on the clinician to discuss potential risks and benefits of PrEP initiation or maintenance during pregnancy with the client. That does not sound very encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> Uganda doesn't even mention pregnancy in their guidelines. Malawi actually did not approve PrEP as well allow for public health intervention at all. Although in July 2019, they began a pilot of PrEP in female sex workers and adolescent girls, and I haven't heard anything further in terms of their progress. And Zambia specifically says PrEP efficacy has not been established in pregnancy and breastfeeding, and use of this population is not recommended. So these are data from a qualitative study that looked at what are the barriers to PrEP pregnancy and breastfeeding in Malawi and Zambia. Um, and they found three different levels, individual, facility, and policy levels. So about a third of the respondents worried about possible side effects of PrEP, potential harm to the infant, due for strict adherence, and the male partners in particular had mixed uh, opinions. 
participants from all the groups emphasize the importance of sensitizing and educating the community at large, demand creation for that. Um, at the facility level, there were concerns about increased burden on healthcare systems, need for added resources, including provider training, screening tools for risk assessment, et cetera. And at the policy level, in particular in Malawi, people wanted local evidence about the safety of the vaccine for their policies. Um, and they wanted demonstration projects, which is why there's been such a delay in that country. So I want to talk a little bit about implementation. This is a study that was actually just published in Lancet HIV about stress use in pregnant women in antenatal care in Canada. Um, and they were looking at 16 antenatal care clinics and approached over 9,000 uninfected women about the potential for PrEP use between November 2017 and June 2018. And they screened all of them for behavioral risk factors. So 22% of the women accepted PrEP. And those who were at more at risk were more likely to initiate PrEP. And if you look at the orange bars here, you can see the, the, the most important thing was that they knew that their partner was HIV positive. Um, younger women and women earlier in pregnancy were more likely to um, start PrEP. And you can see a number of behavioral characteristics, increased likelihood of acceptance of PrEP, including having been forced to have sex, intimate partner violence, and STI diagnosis. Reasons for not initiating PrEP were primarily a low perceived risk when they knew that their partner was HIV negative. So they followed these patients up at one, three, and six months. The so follow up is incomplete. But of those followed for one month, only about 39% returned. Um, of those followed for three months, 22% returned. Of those followed for six months, unfortunately, only 12% returned. When they looked at predictors of, of PrEP continuation uh, at uh, later months, the only uh, finding significantly associated with continuation of PrEP was having a partner with HIV. Reasons given for not continuing PrEP, again, really focused on either having not perceived risk or knowing that their partner was negative. There were no incident HIV infections in the women on PrEP. So further research is critical to evaluate how to best achieve optimal PrEP use, including uptake of long-term use in adherence, particularly in pregnant women. Um, so there's not a whole lot about adolescents women, but there are a number of implementation projects in African adolescent girls and young women that I wanted to mention to you. Um, the uh, PLUS PLUS study is looking at PrEP uptake and continuation in uh, youth 15 to 19 years in South Africa. The EMPOWER study is looking at gender-based violence screening and empowerment clubs on PrEP uptake and continuation in youth. South Africa and Tanzania. HPTN 082 is looking at the effect of drug level feedback on PrEP adherence in adolescents. The 3P is looking at the effect of incentives on adherence. And the power is looking at scaling up PrEP delivery models and different models for youth. Um, lessons learned from all of these projects, similar findings. Number one, the need for demand creation. You need to know that there's PrEP. The community needs to be supportive of PrEP. They found that with education, PrEP interest in uptake was high, greater than 90% in these three studies. Risk score was high, so those who thought they were at higher risk started PrEP. Um, there was a high rate of STIs, intimate partner violence, depression in this population of youth. And they found the importance of PrEP education, not just on the youth themselves, but also on influencers, basically the community, parents and partners, and the need to make PrEP access convenient and to assess the feasibility of using community-based delivery. Um, and these are encouraging data from CROI last year, um, uh, looking at a study, the three P's for PrEP 
prevention study in Cape Town. They enrolled 200 sexually active youth with a median age of 19 years. And they assessed adherence by dry blood spot evaluation of tenofovir diphosphate levels, with high adherence being greater than 700 contramoles per punch, median adherence 350 to 700. So the high and medium are the darker blue boxes here. They found retention of 89% in three months, and that the median tenofovir levels were high. And at two and three months, 50% had high adherence, and 80% had medium or greater adherence. And they found that HIV uh, PrEP adherence was associated with ha having either a partner of unknown HIV status or knowing their partner was HIV positive, and also with them being able to disclose PrEP use. So this is pretty encouraging data on youth, and we need to wait to see the results of the other studies. I wanted to mention this is a new tool. This was um, just published this month by Monica Gandhi and her colleagues. And they have developed a test that's like a pregnancy test, a urine pregnancy test, to look at tenofovir in urine. Uh, and in their analysis of 300 urine samples, comparing this new lateral flow assay to the gold standard liquid chromatography, it has 97% specificity, 99% sensitivity, and accurately classified 98% of those who took the dose. And it's interesting. So they have an antibody that binds to nosphere. So a negative test has no tenofovir in the urine, so the antibodies bind to the line, the antigen line, and form a tenofovir line. So when you see that, that means they're not taking. A positive test has tenofovir in the urine, binds the antibody, so it doesn't bind the antigen line. So it's the opposite of a pregnancy test in terms of looking at it. <laughs> yeah. But it, <clears throat> it's interesting to note whether immediate feedback on the urine, as opposed to using dry blood spot where your patient has to come back the next month, would immediate feedback on the urine facilitate adherence to PrEP, particularly in pregnant women or for the uh, implementation challenges of the use of PrEP. So there are a number of barriers to PrEP use. At the country level, the political and policy level, you've already seen this. Country policies on use vary from being very permissive, specifically mentioning pregnancy, to saying you shouldn't use it at all, and having licensing and regulation. <coughs> Health systems. What's the effect of integration of PrEP into antenatal services and family planning? What kind of training does the provider need? If you need to add a focus on prevention, most of the time when you do HIV testing, everyone focuses on the HIV positive woman, particularly pregnant woman. But the HIV negative woman needs also a focus. At the social level, there's a need for community sensitization and education and demand creation, as we already talked about in that qualitative study. And then at a personal level for the patient, um, there may be risk perception. So a patient may have seasons of risk that vary over time as circumstances change. So they may feel they're at risk at one period, stop prep, not at risk, and then feel they're back at risk and go back. So you may then find this continuing cycle of PrEP depending on the patient's risk. I wanted to, um, at, at the end, mention uh, a study that I thought was really terrific and looked at a number of different modalities of trying to get PrEP used during pregnancy and postpartum. It's called the PrEP PP study. And they did a number of different things. The first thing was they identified hot spots so that they could target women in antenatal care and family planning who were most at risk. So they looked at high HIV prevalence or density geographic areas or places where there were zero discord couples. They did group counseling about PrEP along with HIV group counseling before HIV testing. So everybody gets information about HIV testing, everybody gets information about PrEP. They tried to increase male partner involvement, including HIV testing, but also giving the women uh, the test to home to their partner. And as we talked about before, 
knowing that your partner is HIV positive was a significant motivating factor for women to continue to grow. They included training of nurses and counselors to support integration into antenatal care and family planning settings, multi-month prescriptions for PrEP, making the patient come back every month, means the patient doesn't come back every month. They do this every three months or every six months, they'll come back and actually take the PrEP. And then a number of innovations to support adherence, including M Health and adherence peer group support. And I'm looking forward to seeing the results of this study because I think this is pretty innovative and combines a number of different modalities that may work. So in summary, the PrEP pro program focused on women are still in their infancy and in most settings, uptake remains modest and continuation on PrEP is often, although not always, low. We need to figure out how to make it be higher. While pregnancy is a high risk period for HIV acquisition for women, PrEP studies in pregnant postpartum women have been even more limited than studies in women in general. Um, barriers to uptake and persistence staying on PrEP if women need to be better understood and effectively addressed at all levels, from the individual levels to the structural factors, as I think that PP study is doing. Qualitative research with a particular focus on youth and their social environment is needed to better understand the local and cultural context, gain insight into how women can feel empowered by youth. And the mechanisms in real life implementation by which we can enhance adherence are actually completely critical because the future is additional options may become available. Long acting injectables, vaginal drinks, and what we learn about the use of oral prep will be helpful to use prep in these additional categories. That's it. Thank you.
And so we started going out to, for example, um, DCYRS, which is Youth and Rehabilitation Service, so and talked to a lot of youth about PrEP. No awareness, and they're actually acceptable to taking PrEP, but once you say it daily, they say no. Not going to take it. There's no way because you know my partner doesn't look like a crackhead, therefore they do not have HIV. They're very consistent with a lack of perception of risk. Um, is there any research going into, for example, with PMTCT? We started with ABT, then we did the therapy, then we did ABT the therapy, then we did the three drugs. Same thing for PrEP in terms of other drugs that would be effective at the time-driven and event-driven. <coughs> Because it sounds like when we discuss PEP, they don't even know about PEP. But when we say, hey, there's PEP, they're like, yeah, we'll take that. And going to PEP to PREP seems like, you know, once they have that risk of, oh my God, I might be exposed, yeah. that's the time that they're exposed. So in MSM, um, uh, event driven PREP works. So, you know, before you have sex and after you have sex, there's been no studies in women. Um, and, uh, while in women probably I don't have a concern in pregnancy, you know, the, the, the issue about the drug levels mm -hmm. is, is a little worrisome. I, the, the one study I showed you that's being done where they're looking at one versus two pills of prep a day in pregnancy to see if, if there's any ability to increase levels for whatever that means. Um, so I didn't put in a slide of other types of prevention that are being studied. There are a huge number of other drugs, including injectable cardiacavir, um, other injectable drugs. There's uh, another oral drug that can be taken less frequently. Uh, there's the vaginal ring, um, and then people are looking at implants. So those are all very attractive alternatives. The problem is they're not being studied in women. They're being studied primarily in MSM. And, and, they, and they have a further problem. So if you take carbotexture, the levels can persist for a year after you have the last dose. You can still have levels out for a year. So for women, does that mean that you can't get pregnant for a year? Does it mean they're not going to give it to women? What, what's the effect on pregnancy? And, and it's really important to study that, and there are no studies in pregnancy. And it's the same thing for these other drugs. So I think you know, we keep making the same mistake over and over again, um, and assuming that, okay, well, we show it works in men, we're going to give it to women, and oh my God, no, they got pregnant. You know, surprise. <laughs> um, so we, we really need to have studies in pregnancy to be able to evaluate these. And maybe the injectables. But maybe maybe you can go and ask them. Would they would they take something where they can get a shot once every two months, once every three months? Would that be more attractive? Would it be more attractive to have a, a ring that you put in place and you change once a month? Um, maybe that would be better than a daily pill. But that that's important research to to do. Yes. Uh, kind of a question about the adherence. Uh, have they looked into like women who aren't taking PrEP daily or at a lower level or not at all, but they still have access, do they know where those pills are going? Are they just not taking them? Or are they being sold? Are they going back? I, I, I saw no research that addressed that question. And it's, a, it's a good question. I have no idea. Um, in, in most of the studies, we'll have to come back every month to a funny certificate. But I, I don't know. Another good <laughs> and from the point of treatment, they're frequently with this card. They don't affect the patients if they choose not to take the pill. It does have been quality to with this card. I don't think they've ever been excited what did they do exactly. We do know there's something going on in the community, but it's not that like they're at high rate. But what we do know that even the people in the clinic, and I feel for this card, that even in sex with women uh, and men, that there would be sometimes funny the pill stops right outside of this country, inside, in the ground. From that, that I know follow the description of the people who work in the field. Just anecdotal and working in my area, there actually is an issue of people filling their prescription, whether it's from the study or it's from the Other questions? Thank you for your patience.